What we're going to talk about today uh, in 15 minutes is shoulder arthritis and shoulder replacement. Um, there are really two types of shoulder replacements available today for arthritis. And what we're going to talk about quickly is the relevant anatomy, when we use each of these procedures, um, briefly how we do it without any blood and guts, what can go wrong, and maybe have a minute or two for questions. The important anatomy um, with regard to the shoulder as far as the bone goes is that um, when we do a shoulder replacement, we're going to replace the arthritic part of the humeral head, which has lost its cartilage, as well as the socket. Um, the rotator cuff we're going to talk about in a couple other slides um, in terms of the muscle anatomy. When you look at a left shoulder from the front, you can see um, large muscle covering the outside of the shoulder is the deltoid, so this is the anterior deltoid. And then we have the pectoralis major here. The interval between those two muscles is defined by the cephalic vein, which we use um, as a landmark when we do surgery. And when we do shoulder replacement surgery, we're actually operating through that interval to get uh, deeper into the shoulder. When you get deeper into the shoulder, you then encounter what's known as the rotator cuff, which um, most of you have heard about in one, one manner or another. Looking at the right shoulder from the front, this large muscle here that comes from the front of your scapula is known as the subscapularis muscle. And this is the anterior part of your rotator cuff. And this large muscle comes out laterally to um, the upper part of the humerus and attaches here in what we call the lesser tuberosity. On the back of the shoulder, you can see the other three rotator cuff muscles. So this is the back of a right shoulder. On the top, you, you have the supraspinatus muscle. Then you have the infraspinatus muscle below the spine of the scapula. And just below that, you have the teres minor muscle. And all three of these muscles come out um, under the acromion and attach to the arm on what's called the greater tuberosity. So those are the four muscles of the rotator cuff. Oops. So shoulder arthritis, we've heard uh, already about um, what arthritis is. And basically, it's a loss of cartilage in the joint. Uh, it tends to cause pain. Uh, pain hurts um, worse when people tend to use their arms, but it also hurts uh, more when they lie down. And as it progresses, it hurts uh, even at rest. What does an x-ray of arthritis look like? Um, on this slide, you have a diagram of what a normal shoulder x-ray should look like. And this is the humeral head. Over here is the socket, which is the glenoid again. And there's usually a nice space maintained between these two bones um, by cartilage. So you can see over here what an, what a, an x-ray of osteoarthritis looks like. And here the joint space is narrowed. Um, there is a spur here that actually runs all the way around the head. And there's also a loose body here. So with the loss of cartilage, the joint space narrows. You have these loose pieces that can form. And there's also little small cysts in the bone that you can see, which is also a reaction to the increased stress of the bone-on-bone -bone contact. What that looks like uh, when you actually look at, this is a humeral head that's um, about to be replaced. And there's a complete loss of the cartilage. It's irregular. Uh, there's a spur that goes all the way around. And as you can imagine, this can be quite painful when it's butting up against another bone that has no cartilage on it. Physical exam for shoulder arthritis. Often there is some atrophy of the muscles since people really can't use their muscles normally, uh, secondary to pain. There may be swelling, uh, particularly if there's an associated rotator cuff tear. There's usually tenderness at the joint line. There's usually crepitus, which is another word for snapping and catching and clicking because these surfaces um, create those sounds. And there's typically a painful and limited range of motion. How do we treat it? Well, similar to other types of arthritis, um, we, we will rest a joint that's inflamed. We'll use physical therapy. We use anti-inflammatory medications. Um, Dr. Heffler may let me inject once in a while a shoulder. And eventually, if all else fails, um, we move on to surgical options. In the world of surgery for shoulder arthritis, there's two basic categories. There's the arthroscopic surgery. Arthroscopic surgery can be beneficial in milder forms of arthritis. And what we do is we can clean up the joint, which is known as a debridement. We can smooth over some of the irregular cartilage. We can remove loose pieces. And particularly if they have a stiff joint, we can help them by releasing the capsule. And that's one of the, the more important things we can do for a painful shoulder with mild arthritis. 
Once you get into the more severe types of arthritis, we move into the world of, of shoulder replacement. Within shoulder replacement, hemiarthroplasty is an option where you just replace um, the ball, total shoulder replacement, or replace the ball and socket, and then reverse total shoulder replacement, where you replace both sides, but you actually switch their configuration. Hemiarthroplasty, or just replacement of the ball, we will um, use in younger patients. We will use it in patients where the socket um, isn't really too damaged, or if the socket is severely damaged and there's not enough support to, to replace it. There are surgeons around the country who will use this operation because they're not comfortable doing the socket part of the surgery. And then uh, in the past, we used to use this operation in patients who had arthritis with massive rotator cuff tears. Since then, since the reverse, that, that's changed. Total shoulder replacement was um, brought to us by a man named Charlie Neer. Um, I was fortunate to spend a year with him in the centuries ago at Columbia. And um, he really brought this concept um, to us. And really what he described was an operation where we preserve normal anatomy to the greatest extent possible. There was minimal bone removal. There were no mechanical stops to the prosthesis. The prosthesis provided a painless fulcrum for muscle rehabilitation. And he always emphasized the importance of the treatment of the muscles, particularly around the shoulder, in achieving a good result. Indications, um, you've heard about this before, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis of dislocations, and post-traumatic arthritis. Um, this is one way to dislocate your shoulder, um, not highly recommended. This is one of the ONS ski team members. It's either Kavanaugh or Sethi, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's one of those two guys. But, um, <laughs> and the last indication I want to talk about, which we will, is cuff tear arthropathy. What cuff tear arthropathy is, is severe arthritis coupled with a severe rotator cuff tear that's not repairable. So how do you do the operation? In eight easy steps, um, just to <laughs> simplify this, we're actually, um, we do remove the arthritic head. Um, we do create a channel in the bone for a prosthesis. We do the same thing on the socket side. We create either a keel or pegs to put in the socket. We put a metal prosthesis, uh, usually it's an ingrowth and usually not cemented into the humerus. We uh, do cement a plastic or a polyethylene socket in place. We then have modular um, heads that go on this prosthesis in the humerus and that creates a standard shoulder replacement. And that's been really available for 30, over 30 years. The key about a standard shoulder replacement is that it does require an intact rotator cuff. And here's a, a typical x-ray of an arthritic shoulder, the joint space is narrow, there's a spur on the humeral head, and this patient has had a um, prosthetic um, humerus inserted into the bone, metallic head, and there's a plastic socket over here that has pegs, and the only re you can just barely see a metallic marker that's in the central peg. And this operation works extremely well, it's very reliable, but you must have a rotator cuff that's working. What is the rotator cuff? And Dr. Sethi is going to talk to you about this, I'm sure, in some <laughs> great detail. But um, the rotator cuff tear that can occur usually starts at the supraspinatus. Here's an MRI showing supraspinatus muscle, tendon coming across, and here is a gap where the tear has occurred. And this is an, an arthroscopic picture of a supraspinatus tendon tear. This is clearly a small tear, a repairable tear. But as these tears go, um, can increase in size, they can become massive where all three or four tendons are torn, they retract back to way beyond the socket and they beca can become non-repairable. If you have a non-repairable or severe rotator cuff, what happens? Well, what happens is your deltoid muscle, which attaches down here on your humerus, is pulling up on your arm and there's no counterforce from the rotator cuff. And if there's no counterforce from the rotator cuff, the humeral head gets pulled superiorly. So you can see here that the head in relation to the socket is high, and that's because this patient has no rotator cuff at all. When you had developed this force imbalance, um, the joint doesn't work. You can't lift your arm. So what do you do about it? Well, before the reverse replacement, we would do a hemiarthroplasty. Why? It would help reduce pain. But as you can see, it didn't do too much for function. And the reason is, it's obvious, the humeral head, which has been replaced, is still riding up high, being pulled up by the deltoid, and there's no fulcrum for her to raise her arm. 
So that was the option that we had in the past, but it's no longer the option of choice. Total shoulder replacement, if there's a rotator cuff tear, this head will uh, ride high, it will rock or hit the top of the socket, and it will eventually loosen it. So there's asymmetrical shearing forces on the glenoid, no rotator cuff, and the glenoid loosens. So a sh standard shoulder replacement, not a good idea without a rotator cuff. The reverse prosthesis was approved for use in this country in 2004. However, it's been uh, used in Europe for almost 20 years. The concept behind the reverse prosthesis was a replacement that would function only with the deltoid muscle, that you don't need your rotator cuff anymore to raise your arm. It needed to be stable, and we needed to avoid the risk of glenoid loosening that we had with a, a standard replacement. So just briefly, the principles, and you can see just conceptually what, what happens there. The, the ball, which is normally on the top of your humerus, has now been placed into the socket. So here is the metallic ball, and there's a plastic socket, which you'll see later, that goes here. It is a fixed center of rotation now, um, which has been moved both inferiorly and medially. It increases the uh, lever arm of your deltoid. It reduces the torque on your glenoid as these forces become really compressive as someone raises their arm. And it actually lowers the humerus to restore the tension in the deltoid muscle that was lost when the, um, when the head became elevated. So here are pictures of both types of prosthesis. Um, the reverse prosthesis has a plastic cup that's placed into the humerus and a metallic ball that is actually um, screwed into uh, the scapula. Standard shoulder replacement, pretty obvious, um, maintaining normal anatomy. So this is the a gentleman that was the first reverse shoulder, shoulder, reverse shoulder replacement that I did. He was 72 years old at the time. He came to see me. He had had three previous failed rotator cuff surgeries that had been done uh, through open surgery. And he wasn't terribly happy with the fact that he, that was all he could lift his arm. And that was the amount of abduction that he had. So, um, and this was his x-ray. This was 2006. And you can see in the x-ray that the humeral head is somewhat high relative to the uh, glenoid. There are these metallic anchors in the um, humeral head, status post his prior surgeries. And there is some narrowing of the joint space secondary to arthritis that had developed. So three months after the surgery, this was, so this was May of 06, three months later, you can see his x-ray, and you see the metallic ball, the screws into the scapula, the humeral component um, with a plastic liner that you can't see on, on this x-ray, which has been cemented or glued into the bone, and obviously um, much happier. Um, here's another patient, a woman with osteoarthritis and a bad cuff. Uh, this was about, took her a little bit longer, about six months after her reverse, but also very happy. Um, complications of this prosthesis are higher than the standard shoulder replacement. Um, they include, uh, there's a long list of them. The reason I think the complications are higher is that many of these patients are coming for revision surgery. They've had either prior rotator cuff repairs or they've had prior uh, shoulder replacements that have uh, failed for various reasons. So anytime you get into revision surgery, you're going to have a higher incidence of infection. Uh, you can see instability, as you can see in this picture. There's a, if, particularly if you don't pay close attention to the, um, the uh, biomechanics of how this is put in. Uh, dissociation of the components is really quite rare. Screw breakage is occasional. But overall, what, what I tell patients is that it does have a higher, a higher incidence of complications. So here's a patient who had a hemiarthroplasty of his right shoulder in 2001, <laughs> 2008. <laughs> He's asking me this question, and um, I didn't have a great answer for him, except that it wasn't available in 2001. So that's a quick rundown on shoulder replacement and shoulder arthritis. I'd be happy to answer any questions.